Okay, what a whirlwind, and we're about to wrap up. This is uh, Don Tapscott, probably the father of this discussion in Canada. Don, come out here. Let's see if you can do as well as your son. Actually, I actually like this Tapscott bookend thing. Uh, but I have to tell you, it's a great satisfaction as a parent uh, to have a son who's a tough act to follow. <laughs> How do we ensure that this smaller, smarter, uh, faster, more automated world that our kids and their kids inherit is a better one? Well, I've come to some humbling conclusions. And my journey to get there is, uh, you may remember, I uh, wrote the first bestseller about uh, the internet and the web in business. It's called The Digital Economy in 1994. And 20 uh, years later, I was asked by my publisher to write an anniversary edition. And I had to reflect on what had occurred over the last two decades and where we might be going. And I came to a number of conclusions. The first is that we are entering into a second era of the digital age. And over the last two days, you've heard about many of these extraordinary technologies. Machine learning, AI, technology that does things that it wasn't programmed to do, because it's able to learn. The physical world is becoming smart, and communicating, soon doing transactions. Autonomous vehicles, our energy grid, will become distributed and look more like the internet technology in our bodies, virtual reality, all kinds of extraordinary developments. I also, in collaboration with Alex, came to the conclusion that the foundational technology for all of this is the underlying technology of cryptocurrencies and blockchain. And that this does represent the second era of the internet. And commenting on some of the discussion here today, I agree with Salim. This is going to change the corporation fundamentally, the deep structure and architecture of the firm, and how we orchestrate capability in society to innovate, create goods and services. Companies will look more like networks, and there will be companies with no people. Um, this is not about Bitcoin. Email was the first big app of the Internet of Information. Bitcoin was the first big app of the Internet of Value. But now we're seeing all these new extraordinary platforms. And remember Alex's talk, currencies is one type of digital asset. It'll turn out to be not the most important one by far. The $50 trillion supply chain industry is being rebuilt around this technology. The $100 trillion banking industry will be turned on its head. And one of the reasons that this technology is very important is because it's a much more secure platform than what we have in our organizations today. Now, I came up with this great analogy to describe why it's so secure. But I'm kind of backing off a bit after John Oliver on late night TV did a whole show on the blockchain and had some fun with it. Because of the complicated process the network uses to verify records, it is very secure. Now relax, I'm not gonna get into what that process is or how it works, but I will share a really helpful, really dumb metaphor for why it is safe. The way I like to think of it is that a, a blockchain is a highly processed thing, sort of like a chicken McNugget. And if you wanted to hack it, it'd be like turning a chicken McNugget back into a chicken. Now, someday someone will be able to do that, but for now, it's going to be tough. Hold on, that is an absolutely horrible thought. So why is that reporter so happy about the idea? Because if anyone ever figures out how to turn a chicken McNugget back into a chicken, that chicken is going to be fucked up. <laughs> He's going to spend the rest of his life suffering from PTSD and writing haunting poetry about the experience. The things I saw. Buck, buck, buckor. <laughs> my body is whole, but what of my soul? My body... <laughs> <laughs> so, through this extraordinary collaboration that I've had with Alex, 
we ended up writing um, the, the big book about uh, uh, blockchain. And a new edition did come out this week, and uh, we will do a book signing at the end of the uh, event today. Now, in the original digital economy, I said, I think the internet's gonna be great. It's gonna do all kinds of wonderful things, and it did. But I said, some things could go wrong. The original title of the book was Promise and Peril in the Age of Networked Intelligence. And these are four of them. I said, I think that our privacy could be undermined very fundamentally. That technology could wipe out entire industries. We could start to see structural unemployment. That the old media would collapse and we'd see a fragmentation of, of social discourse. And the governments would not use this to transform themselves, but in fact this technology could hurt the nature of democracy. And I've come to the conclusion that all of those things actually came about. And we're going to need nothing less than a new social contract to move forward. Now, when we went for the agrarian age, the industrial age, we figured out a bunch of things. We figured out people are going to have to be literate. We created the public education system. We made a law. You have to go to school. We figured out people are going to live in the city. We're going to need to have a social safety net. We figured out you can't have one company owning all the oil. We created anti-monopoly legislation. Those are three of dozens and dozens of big innovations to create a new social contract between citizens, governments, uh, uh, corporations, and, and civil society. But let me look at these four. The individual and our privacy. These things are seriously being undermined. First, we have identity theft. Now, if you're like the many people who every day have a, a guy named Don Tapscott trying to sell you some Bitcoin on Instagram or Facebook, it's not me, okay? <laughs> and identity theft is a huge problem. Secondly, we're increasingly spending time in the digital world. And in the physical world, there are all kinds of rules. We know all the algorithms that exist. If I take, say, this thing here, and I drop it, I, I let go of it, what's going to happen? Is it going to go up? Is it going to vaporize? Is it going to spin around? Is there anyone here who thinks it's not going to go down? It went down. We know about the rules, gravity. When I go onto Facebook and I post something, I have no idea what happens to it. I have no idea what happens to my information. Who does that thing go to? If I have a link going somewhere else, it doesn't seem to get as many likes, because right? Facebook has an algorithm that's saying we want to keep people onto Facebook. And the biggest problem has to do with our data. Data is the new asset class of the digital age, probably the most important asset class ever. And we, create this data. So there's the virtual you. And the virtual you knows more about you than you do, because you can't, <laughs> you don't know what you bought a year ago, what you said a year ago, your exact location a year ago, what medication you had a year ago, what diagnosis you had, what you got on that test uh, a year ago. You create all that data, but you don't get to keep it. You know, do you remember Prior to capitalism, anybody study history? All around the world, we had this economic system called feudalism. You didn't have a job and work for money. You were tied to the land of a landlord. You did a lot of work. You grew vegetables or, or, or animals or something, and then you had to give it all away to the landlord, and you got to keep some cabbages. Okay? Well, today, the virtual you, you create all this stuff, but the landlords, big social media companies, banks, governments, and so on, take it away and you're left with some cabbages. And that means that you can't use that data to plan your life. It means you can't monetize that data. It's created the most powerful and valuable corporations in the world. And our privacy is being undermined. And recently at Davos uh, this year, somebody said to me, well, Don, privacy's dead, get over it. And my reaction was, I think that's an ignorant point of view. Privacy is the foundation of freedom. And all this data consists or constitutes our identities. And we need to get our identities back so that we can manage them responsibly and use them 
to help improve our own lives and protect this basic right. So what if we have a new global transactional platform, an internet of value, where we could create a portable identity that's self-sovereign and is owned by us, an identity on a black box, and that identity would sweep up all this transactional data as you go through life, have your health record, your educational record, your micro-credentials, what you got on that biology third lab and what the teacher said, attested to by the university, would contain all this data. You control it, and you decide what is done with it. You decide if you want to anonymize some of it and sell it and you protect your privacy. Well, this is underway, but we need a new social contract to bring this about. We need governments to wake up and step up and provide some leadership along with the private sector, civil society, and all of us as citizens so that we can recapture our identity as a basic foundation of freedom and of prosperity for each of us. Point number one. Point number two. Under the industrial age, all of us achieve prosperity through a job. We work for somebody, unlike feudalism, where you were tied to the land. Well, the new digital age, and Salim's presentation was, was profound about that, is going to wipe out all kinds of industries. Now, according to Joseph Schumpeter, this, this is called creative destruction. What happens is you always have new industries and new jobs that emerge. But as Alex pointed out, this is the second half of the chessboard. Think about that. What we've been through in the first 32 years is an inch. And the next 36 years is going to be thousands of CN towers. That's how fast this stuff is coming. So coal miners, I mean, the reason that we have a a rust belt across the U.S., which has been the foundation of all this populism and anger and all the rest, is not because of Mexicans or outsourcing or Canadians. It's because of technology. That's what did this. 48 of 50 states in the United States, the number one job type is truck driver. Well, saw Salim. That one's gone, not in 50 years, in 15 years. There will be no truck drivers. There will be no drivers. Period. The number one job type for women is cashier. Gone. But this is also knowledge work because computers can diagnose people better than doctors and analyze x-rays better than radiologists and they can dispense pharmaceuticals better than druggists. So how are we going to solve this problem? Well, there's still lots to be done in society. The world is, is unsustainable. It's too conflicted. It's it's too unjust, it's too unequal, but we don't have market mechanisms to create jobs. We're gonna need a new social contract. We're gonna have to rethink the job. Of course, we're gonna need a guaranteed basic income for people who are mentally ill or disabled and can't work, but the thing we really need is to guarantee a job for everybody. Now, they won't come necessarily through the private sector. We'll need new mechanisms. Uh, public sector, civil society, philanthropy, and a really big one is entrepreneurship. That's going to require some thinking. Now, a second part of this problem is that the digital economy and its largesse has been captured by a small handful of powerful companies. They captured the new oil data. And so we have an asymmetrical distribution of wealth. We have this crazy situation, hasn't happened in a century or more, where the economy is growing, the middle class is shrinking, where we have wealth creation and declining prosperity. How are we gonna solve that problem? Well, the way that we think we solve it today is through taxation. We redistribute wealth. Well, that's clearly not working. Perhaps we could use this technology to pre-distribute wealth. So we could change the way that wealth gets created in the first place by having a more democratic economy. You know, we could, there are two billion people who don't have access to financial services, but most of them have a supercomputer in their pocket. Using blockchain, we can bring those people instantly into the global economy. 70% of land titles in the world 
are not enforceable in the developed world. You're in Honduras, you, a dictator comes to power, he says, I know you got a piece of paper that says you own your land, but the government computer says my friend owns your land. Well, you put the land titles on a blockchain, no dictator or a corrupt official in India can mess with that, unless they know how to turn a chicken McNugget <laughs> back into a chicken. <laughs> we create a true sharing. Uber's not a sharing economy. It's a service aggregator. Imagine if Uber was a distributed application on a blockchain where the owners of vehicles receive all of the value that they create. That can be done, and it's underway today. Remittances are a trillion dollars. The global diaspora, people who've left their ancestral lands, they send money back, back home. This is bigger than all foreign aid. This is really important. And these people get charged 10 to 20%. It takes four to seven days for the money to go from Toronto to Manila. Well, now you use Paycase, and it takes minutes for the money to go from your device to your mom's device. We can ensure that musicians are fairly compensated for the value that they create. And we can have a halcyon days of entrepreneurship because the little companies can now have all the capabilities of big companies without the main liabilities. Salim was referring to that, Ronald Coase. The reason that we have all these big vertically integrated companies is largely because of transaction costs. Number three, I said in the digital economy, I think the internet's gonna bring us together because we'll all have access to the same information. I said, it could go the other way. I mean, we could end up following our own point of view, and we could end up in these little self-reinforcing echo chambers where the purpose of information is not to inform us, but maybe it's to give us comfort for our preconceived ideas. How do we inform ourselves as a society when the old ways of doing that are collapsing? I guarantee a decade from now, your newspaper will not be something that gets delivered to your doorstep. Newspapers are declining. We have this huge problem of information overload. When I was a kid, there were two newspapers in Toronto that we, we got access to, and a total of five TV stations. Now young people today have millions of TV stations. And now we're moved into this post-fact society where the President of the United States can tweet that he's been wiretapped by his predecessor, which is A, impossible, and B, preposterous, and a third of the population believes it. Apparently 20% of Americans think vaccinations are a bad idea. I was talking to an epidemiologist at Davos who said, we're gonna need a new plague before people start to understand that science and medicine is actually important. So how do we inform ourselves? Well, some big developments. Blockchain and AI can come together to create a truth machine. So if someone posts, as I read recently on Facebook, had tens of millions of views, then Morgan Freeman thinks Hillary Clinton should be jailed. That's the way to go forward. I can go back and trace the provenance of that information and find out it comes from a notorious liar and faker of stories. We can mandate, why, why doesn't every kid in every school have to go through media literacy training every year to develop that? Why don't we have public support for a sovereign independent news media? We need to strengthen public radio and these public institutions. And they don't have to be pravda, they can be truly independent. We know how to do that these days. And everyone needs to develop their own personal responsibility. I know with our kids, we said, we want you to develop your BS detectors, because there's a lot of BS on the internet. You need to know how to think critically. The last point, is there anyone here who thinks the internet fundamentally changed government and democracy for the better? We paved the cow path in government, and as for democracy, Houston, we have a problem. Respect for government's at an all-time low, and the recent data on Donald Trump is not in yet, but I'm guessing this chart didn't go up. <laughs> now, legitimacy is the concept, according to Seymour Martin Lipson, that you may disagree with who's in power, but at least you think the institution is a good one. Well, democracy 
is not viewed very positively, and it's getting worse. Young people all around the world are not voting. A lot of them agree with the bumper sticker, don't vote, and only encourages them. And <laughs> that's a terrible thing, but you can kind of see where they come from, given the behavior of politicians. And the, there's some big problems here. One is that politicians are beholden to big money. 97% of Americans think there should be a background check on firearms, but Congress can't pass a law reflecting the will of the people, government for the people, by the people, of the people. This is risible. So we need to move to a whole new paradigm in democracy. First wave was good. We created these representative institutions, but there was a weak public mandate. Citizens were inert. It was opaque, and politicians are beholden to big powerful interests. Maybe we could use this technology to build a second wave where we could have transparency, a culture of public deliberation, active citizenship. And here's a crazy idea, representatives that are accountable to citizens. How could that happen? Well, the e-voting is just the tip of the iceberg. It will never work unless you have blockchain because nobody's going to vote on a computer unless you know the double spend problem that Alex described has been fixed, that your vote's not going to be moved to somebody else or recounted. Blockchains enable transparency. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. Let's create a more transparent and open world. Make politicians and governments naked. When you're naked, there are some corollaries that flow from that. One of them is that fitness is no longer optional. You know, if you're going to be naked, you've got to get buff. Um, <laughs> Thirdly, imagine a smart vote. Salim talked about smart money. You send your kid off to school, and the money says, sorry, you can't spend me in the bar or on weed or something. I'm only good for books and tuition. Um, well, why can't you have a smart vote inside a smart contract that says, you're a politician. This vote only matters if you do what you said you would do. And if you don't do it, bad things are going to happen. Maybe you're not going to get paid money. Maybe funds won't flow. Maybe you're going to be impeached. And then we can have new platforms for citizen engagement. Not direct democracy, but engaging the population in the co-creation and, and, and co-innovation of a future. We need a new Bretton Woods. We shouldn't be smashing these precious institutions, as is being done today. They were created after the Second World War to kind of prevent things like world wars again. And when it comes to, just an example, Korea and getting rid of nuclear weapons, well, that would be great, but what we really need is some bigger thinking. We need a new Marshall Plan, like we did after the Second World War, to rebuild North Korea and bring it into the global economy. No country can succeed in a world that's failing, and our world is full of difficulties. Final point, actually, I'm not going to make that. It was a good point. We'll save it for later. <laughs> so these are four themes of about a dozen that we're studying in the Blockchain Research Institute. We had an old contract. Well, individuals have freedom. You get prosperity through a job. We have the free press that you can trust, and Walter Cronkite tells the truth. And governments are formed by and of the people. The digital age was at the center of cracking some of these very fundamental tenets of our social contract. We need to move towards a new social contract, and the stakes are very, very high. What is your role? Well, leadership for change, when you have a new paradigm, can come from anywhere. And you've self-selected as a group that's come here today, you care about this stuff. And if we do this right, governments, civil society, corporations, and us as individuals, then maybe, maybe the smaller world our kids inherit can be a better one. And this new digital age will be an age where the promise is fulfilled. But only if we will it. Thank you very much.